Hello, everybody. I'm really happy to be here, but my stomach, I don't think, is very excited about it. Um, but I left my son back in Australia um, with his um, father. But, um, so I'm excited about it, but I'm also very nervous uh, about being away from my family. Uh, but he always wants to come with me to everything. You know, children kind of feel left out uh, all the time. When I tell him that I need to go to the chemist, he's like, fine, go. I told him I was going to a chemist in Brighton, England, and he didn't believe me. So he said he really wanted to come to Meaning. Um, he couldn't come, so I was wondering if I could just film a short video of you saying hello, Leo, on three, so that he doesn't feel left out, if, if, and that I can come back as a star parent. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Okay. Oh, oh, yes, I have space. That's a good thing. One, two, three. Oh, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. So um, I uh, am actually very touched by the topic uh, of this conference, which is a rather, you know, uh, special word, a very important word, meaning. And I think particularly during this time when I feel like everybody wakes up uh, and comes face to face with meaninglessness itself. Uh, and it feels good to be part of a group of people who are uh, trying to bring back that, uh, I, I don't want to say hope, but um, I guess realistic um, and um, non-cynical, because I think that's the cynicism that really is breaking everything down um, at the moment. So I'm very excited uh, ab ab about that topic. And in thinking about this talk today, it really struck me that everybody has um, different values. You know, uh, what we see as important as meaningful differs from person uh, to person. But, you know, despite these differences, um, the quest for meaning is, is always there. Um, you know, throughout of human life, uh, it never disappears. Uh, running through, you know, like a thread through, through the story of uh, every uh, human experience is that very familiar question, you know, what does this all mean? Um, and it's a fundamental aspect, I think, of what makes us human and what makes it so hard, but also so interesting uh, uh, to be human. Kind of this instinct to question our, uh, uh, the meaning of our own existence seems to be the catalyst for so many things that make life worth living um, in the first place. So, you know, music, art, literature, and so, so on. So the results of our, um, uh, of our sort of quest for meaning are all around us. Uh, but I think that meaning itself is actually extraordinarily uh, elusive. Uh, throughout our lives, I think it, it seems to do, uh, at least in my experience, a little dance. You know, it comes and it goes. It's a very frustrating uh, uh, performance. And, and even when meaning is present in our lives, so when we sit down and we think and we feel its presence, um, it likes to keep an element of mystery. You know, it's hard to see, e even when it's around, and it seems to prefer uh, uh, the dark. So uh, for about, I've spent about four years exploring the dark side uh, of innovation, um, trying to convince people that uh, there's actually a lot that we can learn from, from uh, those who work in the unseen corners of the world. You know, so-called misfits, uh, pirates, hackers, uh, gangsters, Con artists, uh, pranksters, uh, you know, ex, ex prisoners, um, and from this exploration um, into the world of outlaws and, and undesirables, I found over and over again that they too uh, look for meaning. So when a Somali pirate is uh, uh, hijacking a ship off the coast of of Somalia, he is often asking himself why he's doing that. Uh, when uh, a young drug dealer is trying to find a way to secure a few corners, uh, he's building a narrative that is, uh, attaches some sort of meaning to those actions. When a copycat is replicating uh, a uh, pharmaceutical, uh, there is a story there about why, why she believes that her mission um, is a worthy one. So we are not uh, the only people who seek to draw out meaning uh, from experience. You know, everybody does that. Uh, we're, we're certainly um, not the only ones. So um, 
the, uh, there's a brief, uh, I want to give you just a brief example of that. I, me I mentioned Somali pirates, and actually a few years ago I interviewed um, a, a group of Somali pirates. And uh, piracy in Somalia started as a very unsophisticated uh, business in the early 90s. And, and it came about as a response uh, to foreign trawlers who were stealing the fishing stock um, that people on the coast depended on for, for income. So uh, a group of fishermen got together and uh, they, they would uh, see the ships that crossed their shores and sort of an opportunistic and uh, sort of affair and they would hijack them and uh, then they would split the spoils according to how much each um, fisherman had invested in the operation or either split the spoils uh, equally uh, as well. And uh, the, 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 the government of Somalia collapsed in 1991 after a very brutal civil war, so the Navy and Coastal Police wasn't able to repel the illegal fishing and also wasn't able to repel uh, the response uh, to it as well. So um, then something happened. A uh, civil servant noticed that this, th that this was going on, and he thought that it would be a good idea to scale um, this um, small, lo-fi cottage industry. And um, he approached investors, um, and I quote, with a very good business idea, and he uh, founded an organization called the Somali Marines. And he recruited employees, many of them the original um, pirates on the coast, uh, provided them with military-style training, and um, established what is today known as modern Somali piracy, which is the uh, capture for ransom of large commercial vessels uh, with the use of uh, motherships as bases uh, across uh, the ocean. And the pirates began to command you know, ransom payments. You might have um, seen this in the news over, all, over the years that were in the millions, you know, to, to the average haul was um, 2.7 uh, million uh, US dollars, and since the first known hijacking in 2005, um, over 149 hijacked ships uh, for about an estimated $385 million, and, and with links all across the world as well. So it turned um, f from a very small cottage industry into a quite a large um, international, well-organized um, organization. Pirates even um, employed uh, lawyers and negotiators um, and banknote checkers and even sort of small local economies would spring up um, on the coast while uh, negotiations for ransom payments were ongoing. Uh, it, you know, providing with the hostages and the pirates with, um, uh, you know, water cut, uh, which is a narcotic leaf, um, and uh, food and mobile phone services. But here's the thing about Somali pirates that I was more interested in, beyond the economics of how the movement scaled. Um, the initial pirates, uh, the original pirates, who were fishermen, were being very genuine when they said that they became pirates because of the attacks on their fishing stock and that they were only safeguarding what was originally theirs to begin with. Um, but the truth of the story was lost relatively quickly. Um, most of Somalia's pirates lack a history in fishing. It's a marginal activity in Somalia. It's not part of Somali diet. It's actually looked down upon as a way of making a living. But every single pirate I spoke to said the same thing. You know, they said, we are the protectors of our coast. We do this because of the attacks on our stock. They were all on message. And what this shows me is an incredible PR machine that is ensuring that the meaning of what they are doing isn't lost, um, even if it's, if it's untrue. So the pirate entrepreneurs, like many of the entrepreneurs that we come across uh, in the world that we operate uh, within every day, think about how to build culture, uh, how to recruit and retain the best employees, and how to give them a sense of mission uh, that goes beyond monetary gain, even though that's uh, the ultimate goal. You know, in our world, we talk about how to find purpose. You know, why do we sell iPhones and, and, and iPads and MacBooks? And, and because we believe in beautiful products and we want to change uh, the world with them. Um, well, then, when you're pirating, you also need that why. So, so misfits, what I found, um, provide an answer uh, that why as well. There was a story that really stuck out for me when I was thinking about uh, the talk today. 
this, this is Dwayne uh, Jackson, and um, he's a guy that I met a few years ago. He, he lives uh, near here in Hove, and uh, we met um, many times. We had very long conversations about his life. Uh, Dwayne grew up in children's homes all over East London. Uh, he was kicked out of his house when he was 11, year, uh, 11 years old, uh, kicked out of school when he was 15. Uh, and he was actually on the verge of being institutionalized uh, when a child psychologist um, assessed him and in his report concluded that um, he would either be a master criminal or an extremely successful businessman. And this conclusion became sort of a foreshadowing of a future that he was yet to shape, but uh, uh, not immediately. So in his early 20s, uh, Dwayne fell in with a drug trafficking ring, and he was struggling to pay his rent and his bills, and most significantly for him, a 400-pound debt to his own mother. So he agreed to traffic uh, drugs from uh, England to the United States, and um, he was arrested uh, in Atlanta in possession of 6,500 tablets of, of ecstasy. Uh, but let's back up a little bit uh, to Dwayne at age 15, before the drug trafficking and before the uh, stint in prison. He spent two and a half years um, in prison in England. Uh, and while he was sitting in the dining room of a children's home that he had been living in, um, he noticed an old ZX Spectrum computer. Uh, he taught himself to code with it. He found the manual, um, and he became obsessed with it because it provided him, it was a challenge, but it also provided him with um, a certain level of uh, consistency and uncertainty that had been missing from every aspect of his life. Um, and he actually continued coding while he was in prison. He used to code with pen and paper and then call a programmer on the outside and then they would decode, uh, debug the code uh, together. Um, and so instead of prison being this place that kind of stunted and limited his development, it actually became uh, a place where he would uh, gain uh, really hugely important skills and perspective. Um, he said, for example, that in prison you notice everything around you because you have so much time to sit still. 90% of your time in prison is bloody boring, so everything takes on an additional meaning and every de little detail begins to matter. So for example, he said you can make hot baked beans on toast by cutting a plastic bottle in half, putting water in it, and heating it with um, wires from a stereo, and therefore heating the beans, and then using the same heat to toast the bread on the metal wires that you find under prison uh, mattresses. So um, these things, materials, aren't useless. They're, they're ways to, to, to cook a meal. Now, the forced stillness of prison provided Duane with kind of the sort of perception that he needed to find meaning in the things that seemed most meaningless, really. So perhaps it isn't as elusive as we believe it is, as I said I believe it is when I started talking. Perhaps it's everywhere, but we are moving at a speed that isn't really um, allowing us um, to take it in. So when Duane made it out of prison, I have to speak very quickly because I have about uh, a minute and a half. Um, left. Um, when he made it out of prison, he used this keen sense of observation that he had sort of honed through imposed stillness. Uh, when he was released, um, he started a, a company called Cashflow. Has anyone heard of it? Um, it's uh, great. Um, and it's an accounting platform. Um, and he um, began, before that, he began working as a freelance web developer. And he stumbled onto a problem. He didn't have a way to organize his invoices um, in, in, a, in, a, in, in a straight way. This was the early 2000s, and everything that the software that was around was counterintuitive and confusing. I'm sure people here remember the time when you had to buy software on CDs and everything was annoying and, and impossible to deal with. Um, so he kind of thought, and he said, what's going on around here? Can I create something better? So at the time, the business model in the industry was for software to be built for the desktop. Um, and the perceived wisdom would have been to follow uh, this path. But um, Duane was a web developer, and he, he didn't have money to hire desktop developers, and he didn't have the skill to do it. So using kind of the attention to detail, he thought, I have web hosting space, and I also have this ability to program online, so what can I do with it? So instead of building a competing um, uh, desktop program, he created his own accounting software, uh, and this was on the cloud, and this was 2005. Uh, and it was not the thing, the cloud was not the thing that it is today. So by paying attention, uh, by simply noticing what was available to him, uh, like you make hot baked beans on toast, he avoided falling, falling into the trap 
of following the herd. Um, you know, his business was a success, um, and he sold it uh, in 2013 uh, for quite a huge amount of money, but that's not the important bit. To me, the beauty of this whole thing is that Duane arrived at this way of uh, accessing software and became a pioneer of this way in which we do everything today uh, by virtue of his life experience, the life experience that taught him the tremendous benefits of just stopping for one second. Um, in closing on conversation, and I'm almost done, um, Dwayne told me something that remains etched uh, in my brain. He said, at no other point in your life do you get to press pause for two years and think about where you are and how you got there. Um, and I was lucky, he said, that I had that opportunity. I was lucky. And uh, he's right. You know, when do we create the space for reflection and for stillness? You know, we're analog beings but we run at a relentless digital pace, and I think it's important to ask ourselves what the cost uh, of that is. Uh, just to close, there is a wonderful book um, called The Art of Stillness by Pico Ayer, and he describes stillness in such a beautiful way. He said, to me, the point of sitting still is that it helps you to see through the very idea of pushing forward. If it does have benefits, uh, sorry, indeed, it, it um, leads you into a place uh, where you are defined by something larger. And if it does have benefits, then they lie within some invisible bank account uh, with a very high interest rate, but very long-term yields uh, to be drawn upon at that moment, surely inevitable, when the doctor walks into your room shaking his head or uh, a car, another car veers in front of yours, and all that you will have to draw upon are what you have is what you have collected in your deeper moments. Um, that really struck me, all that you will have to draw upon is what you have collected in your deeper moments. Everything else um, is just noise, really. We don't have to be uh, thrown into prison or dragged into desperate circumstances to choose how we derive meaning um, from experience. Um, if we learn how to stop uh, and reflect, it's possible, uh, hard, and we might not always want to, but possible to find purpose and, and meaning in, in everything that at first glance um, might seem like nothing. So I hope this was helpful. Thank you, and I apologize for going over time. Thank you so much.